Amen. Amen. Praise God. Thank you for coming to the house of the Lord tonight. Let's go into the word of the Lord. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. I'm going to start a series, and uh, it will be two or three weeks, depending on how it goes. And uh, even though, you know, you want to hear the title, it might make you wonder, <laughs> but the title is what would be appropriate. The title of the series is The Truth About Trauma. But I've come to encourage you tonight, and I promise you that, I've come to encourage you, because the Bible tells us what to do with suffering. The Bible tells us what to do with trauma, and we're going to see tonight the power of the Word over our sufferings. First yes. Peter 4, 12 and 13, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing had happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. Amen. 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 Lamb, would you pray over this message? Lord, I pray that you touch this message tonight, Lord, that you touch your ears, and our hearts to receive it. In Jesus' name, I pray that you will not let us to speak the word. In Jesus name. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. <clears throat> the Apostle Peter was reaching out to the church when he called them beloved. And he said, I don't want you to think it's strange considering something that is coming your way. And it is a fiery trial. Now that, of course, is not something you want to hear from the preacher who is prone to prophesy things that come to pass as the Apostle Peter was. A, an apostle and prophet of God, having preached, or as somebody brought up to me, I was having a conversation with a preacher last night, really, on the day of Pentecost, it was really a, more of a teaching than it was preaching, but having preached the very first message of the New Testament church after the outpouring of the Holy Ghost, he was prophesying all that God was going to do, and now you hear this man writing a letter to you saying, there's a fiery trial coming your way. And I don't want you to think it's weird that it's going to happen. And so this is a theme throughout the Bible uh, to tell us how to deal with traumatic circumstances that have happened to us, are happening to us, or have yet to take place. To not think them strange. As so some strange thing happened unto you, you can replace the word strange with weird. As though some weird thing happened unto you, some unusual thing or uncommon thing had happened to you. Instead, rejoice. So this is where Brother James' teaching is always so good in teaching us to do the opposite of what the flesh wants to do. And so when we would be tempted to think it weird, unusual, cry, woe is me, instead we rejoice, praise the Lord. Amen. Whether it's something that happened in the past, something that is happening right now, or something that is in the future. Because when we are partakers of his sufferings, which means we are carrying our cross while we are identifying with his cross. We don't just identify with the cross of Jesus Christ through salvation. We identify with the cross of Jesus Christ for the rest of our lives. All of our lives are lived in the shadow of the cross as we each take up our own cross. And so the truth about trauma is revealed in the shadow of the cross of Jesus Christ. Amen. And over the course of these next two, maybe three lessons, I'm going to show you what the Bible has to say about trauma. Uh, the scripture tells us that when we are partakers of his sufferings, which is not something any of us in our own flesh would ever want to do, even the flesh of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, said, if there's any possibility for this cup to pass from me, would you please let it be so? And of course, he immediately knew as his spirit communed with his flesh and with the Father. No, there's no way. Let your will be done. Our flesh is not better than the flesh of Jesus Christ. And so we say the same things, Lord, is there any way? But as we are partakers of his sufferings, not because of what our flesh wants to do, but because the spirit being within us reaches out to Christ and says, I want to partake of your cross. While the flesh is saying, shut up, shut up. Don't say that. So when his glory is revealed, 
we will also be glad with exceeding joy. And so this is a reference, clearly a reference to his glory being revealed when he returns. <laughs> and if we are partakers of his sufferings, then we will be caught up with him. The Bible says, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. We're with the Lord. <coughs> now we feel the seating together in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. But we also were going to be glad with exceeding joy when he returns. We live in a world today where definitions are changing. Uh, in the last 25 years, the word narcotic has changed to... A, I, I was part of the D.A.R.E. program in high school. Anybody remember that? Drug Abuse oh, Resistance yeah. Education. And we were taught what narcotics <laughs> are. We were taught the power of one drink to slow your reaction time in the car. We were taught the power of even a couple of puffs off of a joint to slow your reaction time in the car, uh, being just as <coughs> dangerous or even more dangerous than driving down the road with your phone like this. And so we were not only taught that with, with, effect, with the effects that it had on driving, but we were taught the effects that it had on our brains, the long-term <coughs> effects. And I, we were taught it specifically in biology class, Mr. Bill Denny, best biology teacher ever in Carnegie, Mississippi, he had drugs. And if you're a teenager, it was very exciting to see drugs. And so he had drugs, and the sheriff brought him in, and he taught us what's this, and what's this, and this is crack pipe, etc., etc. And so, uh, but nowadays, uh, about half of the drugs in that case are no longer considered narcotics even though they are uh, psychoactive chemicals. Um, so we, we have definitions being changed, just like the Bible promised, that when the days are evil, good will be called evil, and evil will be called good. This is happening in our world right now, especially in the Western society. So the word, tra word trauma, is the, the definition of it has been changed. Now, um, what we knew to be true about trauma a generation ago has basically devolved into a mass of people scrambling to become heroes through victimization yeah. that is often manufactured. Mm -hmm. There's only two letters difference between victim and victor. And I want you to leave this place tonight convinced that you are not a victim. Yeah. I want you to leave the, these lessons that I'm going to teach according to the Word of God, believing that you are a victor and not a victim, yeah. not succumbing to the teaching of often manufactured victimizations. People want to become heroes by getting someone's attention. That's not what a hero is. A hero is not someone who has been through suffering, even the worst kind. That's not what a hero is, because then that would mean that everybody is a hero. And not everybody is a hero. Heroes are people that do extraordinary things above and beyond what other people do. So I don't believe it when my kids come home with papers from... Uh, from middle school and from elementary school saying, I'm a hero. <laughs> I, I worked in the lunchroom for, where's Sister Jackie? She's not in here, but she worked with me in the lunchroom for like six years. And there's a lunch lady hero day. I'm sorry, I was a lunch lady and I was not a hero. <laughs> I was just serving food. You know, I was getting paid. Heroes are the people that went to Vietnam. And didn't come back or came back. You know, my father-in-law, a hero. People that served their country and uh, did it for not that much money. Police officers th taking their lives into their hands and going out and trying to protect citizens. Uh, doctors and nurses working excruciatingly long hours. People that do extraordinary things above and beyond. A hero is not someone who has... Uh, got told they couldn't do something <laughs> and they believe they're a victim. The word trauma is in fact one of the many synonyms for the word suffering. So when we see suffering in the scripture, we could replace it with our modern word trauma. Uh, trauma nowadays means just about anything. <clears throat> and you could, I've had, had, you know, to correct kids now that I'm a bus driver and I had to correct kids when I was in the lunch room. And these are the type of children that will go home and tell their parents they got corrected, and the parents will say, you're a victim. Sure. 
and go to school and correct the teacher through the administration. This is the kind of world we live in. We have a social change of definition. And what happens is it leaves the true victims of true trauma in the lurch. So they don't get the attention that they need. And I will tell you, uh, I'm not referencing anyone at this church, but I will tell you at, at the time times that I've been a pastor, the people that take up the most time of the pastor are the people that need the less help, that the answer is in the message. All they have to do is listen to the preaching. And the people that really need my help don't come to me because they don't want to bother me. And that, you see, that's the difference. And that is true. It's the 80-20 rule. It's true of every pastor in every church. And so when we figure out what trauma really is, and we figure out how the Bible teaches us to respond to it, then we will learn to rid ourselves of any desire for the status of victimhood. The status of victimhood is supposed to die somewhere between the ages of 3 and 13. You know, the last gasp of the victimhood of the teenage girl is, Mom, I hate my life. The last gasp of the teenage boy is just the screaming and the, and the slamming things down, etc., etc., and then the child grows up and begins to realize that the parents were actually pretty good to, it, to the child. The victimhood dies somewhere in, in the teenage years. And, and the child begins to realize, hey, it was my own life. None of that really mattered in the first place. I'm out on my own. I can do whatever I want. The child goes from victim to victor. And the parents become heroes in the child's eyes. Everything changes when the child has his own children. This is what it's like when we come to know Jesus Christ. We go from being victim. We go from being property, ownership belonging to Satan, to giving ourselves freely to Jesus Christ and becoming victorious in Him. Praise God. Amen. And so that suffering becomes a part of our existence, not because we are seeking it, but because we're seeking Jesus Christ. And we grow in Him. I'm telling you the truth about trauma is that there is there are only two letters difference between victim and victor. And I want you to remember that. You can be a victor in Jesus Christ if you are a partaker of Christ's sufferings. And don't sweat the small stuff. The word, the word trauma simply refers to any kind of suffering. What used to be understood as the pain of a sudden injury, a soldier returning home from combat, the medical aftermath of a car accident, the unexpected loss of a loved one, the grief of the divorce process, the emotional scars left from physical abuse, or other such extraordinary difficulties of life is now being defined as just about anything. There is an answer to trauma from within the pages of God's Word, and it is very easy and plain for us to apply it to our lives. But first, we need to face the truth about what really is and what isn't a traumatic occurrence. We need to undoctrinate ourselves from the teaching of the world. We need to understand that in order to be able to be a partaker of Christ's sufferings, we have to be stronger. <coughs> we have to grow in strength emotionally and in our minds and in our spirits. Hebrews 12 and 2 through 3 <clears throat> tells us about perspective. Everybody say perspective. 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 Hebrews 12 and 2 through 3, of course, Hebrews 12 follows what chapter of Hebrews? Hebrews 12 comes after what? Faith chapter. The faith chapter, absolutely. So in the chapter previously, Hebrews 11, we see perspective. And then Hebrews 12 gives us the ultimate perspective. Verse 2, looking unto Jesus. Everybody say looking unto Jesus. Okay. You see, that's the perspective. The author and finisher of our faith. Who, for the joy that was set before him, endured trauma, having your body beaten, unrecognizable, having your beard plucked, your face punched, having yourself with nakedness nailed to a cross, dying of asphyxiation, loss of blood and bodily fluids, is trauma if there ever was trauma. Jesus despised the shame, and he is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. What was the contradiction? He who knew no sin became sin. That's a contradiction. 
That's the worst trauma. It wasn't even what happened to his body. It was what happened to his soul. And the father turned his face away for the scripture commands. The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, but his face is against them that do evil. And so the Son of God had to look here at the Father. And he screamed out in Aramaic, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. Trauma of the worst kind. No one has ever gone through such difficulties. There's an answer for trauma in the pages of the Word of God, and it is Jesus Christ. He endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. So the world's answer to trauma is to be weary and faint in our minds, and I would be a liar if I stood before you and say, and say right now that I've never been there. I've been there. I've made the mistake. I've lived in frustration, and I've lived in times of failure. I've lived in times of personal anger and, and even allowed bitterness to grow. But those, praise God that I was delivered of those things because I learned how to deal with suffering. Amen. I learned how to look to Jesus. I learned how to focus on his face. Praise the Lord Amen. for simple songs that I was raised with in those times when I would be reminded, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in this wonderful face. Stop looking at these people around you. Nothing against any of you. <laughs> and the things of this world will grow strangely dim. If you keep talking about your problems over and over and over again, no, in the light of his glory and your grace. Thank you, Jesus, that I can look at you. Amen. It isn't always bad things that you're turning your eyes off of. Right. Sometimes it's just people that none of you have done me any wrong today, as far as I know. <laughs> None of you have done me any wrong today. I don't have anything against you. But I need to look at Jesus, Brother James. Sometimes I just need to look at Jesus. Question, is it really trauma? We ask ourselves the question if it's really suffering. The word suffering is uh, with respect, and, and the word suffering and trauma have traditionally, before the modern era, had to do with extraordinary difficulties. Torture, these are synonyms of suffering. Agony or torment, generally having to do with pain of the more intense kind, extraordinary pain. A great way to understand the concept of what trauma really is is to compare what you're going through with some of the things that people have been forced to endure in the past. We really do need to look back at our history. And we don't even have to look back at formal history. Every one of us knows somebody in our family's past the difficulties they've gone through. Maybe you know somebody even right now. I can tell you some things about people in other countries you don't want to hear. But we need to understand that when we are tempted to feel sorry for ourselves, that we need to remember there have been people who have had difficulties far beyond us. They are mentioned, some of them, in Hebrews chapter 11. Isaiah served the Lord for many years, probably one of the longest vocational careers of a prophet in the Old Testament. And then he was sawn in two. How do you like that? And it wasn't by a magician that put him back together. Okay? He was sawn in two. This is a difficulty. John was able to die sometime around 93 AD as an old man. But he had to deal with the scars of being boiled in a pot of oil and not dying. Probably wishing, I guarantee you, at one point that he would have died. But then he wouldn't have been able to see the, the revelation. Right, right. So consider other people have been through difficulties much worse than our difficulties. Even now in some regions of the world, what's happening in Sudan. Right. Nothing compared to what's happening in the United States. Right. It's a very difficult situation. Continuing persecution of Christians in Sudan. We thank God for what we have. Perspective can help you become grateful for your life as it is and help us to understand whether or not it really is trauma. Perspective. When we look at how grateful 
we should be, we can gain the all-important perspective about our circumstances. From that, something will begin to change within us and appreciation will begin to grow. And that will manifest itself over time as the strengthening of our personal character. Character, of course, is another word which definition has changed over time. But it simply means our emotional resolve within us. The strength of our personal, emotional, mental resolve. How strong are you? The Bible tells us to be strong, which is an inference to be stronger. Because the Galatians were told to be strong, he was, he was reprimanding them for Judaizers having deceived them, and he told them to be strong, which meant be stronger. The Bible is constantly pushing us to be stronger in our personal character. For example, <coughs> if I was a child, as a child I was corrected, I was told no sometimes. And I could come here and tell you that that was traumatic. At the time I thought it was traumatic, because I didn't get what I wanted. Sometimes I was corrected by corporal punishment. <laughs> Not sergeant punishment, or lieutenant punishment, corporal punishment. That wasn't suffering. That was my mom having enough of me <laughs> in my mouth. And we, I got in trouble sometimes. We, she still got a cookie jar, and it's a monk. And it says on his belly, and he's got his hands folded, and he's got, you know, his head comes off. And then I, one of my earliest memories is Fig Newton's being down in there. And of getting caught with my hand literally in the cookie jar. And on his belly, he's got his hands folded. He's got tassels coming down. and says, thou shalt not get fat. <laughs> Best cookie jar ever. <laughs> but when I was caught, Sister Kim, it wasn't trauma. It was to me at the time. But it wasn't real trauma. <clears throat> Perspective. I look back now and I think, I thank God Mom told me no. Yeah. I appreciate that. It's a blessing. So that's not real trauma. If something is happening to us and life or the Lord or someone that loves us is reaching out to us to try to help us and they're suggesting to us that maybe the way we're going is wrong, that's not trauma. That's somebody that loves you. That's somebody that cares about you. We should thank God if we have parents that told us no. We should thank God every single day. What is trauma with respect to children and parents? Being physically abused. That's trauma. That's real trauma. That is suffering. You know what is suffering and traumatic? Having to do with children and parents? Not having parents. I have the blessing of preaching and ministering to 10 of the most beautiful children I've ever seen in my life. In Nepal. And they, in their situations have them in an, in an orphanage without any parents in their life for one or more reasons. In many cases, the parents are not alive. And it makes me think, thank God. I was raised by a single mom, but I had a dad that I could visit once a year that loved me, taught me how to pray. It's not the ideal situation, but I had, I had a parent, and I didn't have my dad in my life as much to raise me. So... Of course, there were difficulties, but at least I had one working with me at, at all the time. Amen. Some of them don't have any. Thank God for that. Yes. So you see what I just did? I compared my situation to someone who was worse off than me. Yeah. And it, it taught me to say, thank God for my mom. And thank God for the summers that I spent with my dad, preaching out, spending time with him. I'm thankful for that. And so I, and what, I didn't get the raisin that I should have because my dad wasn't in the picture, but at least he was able to have, you see what I'm doing? I'm talking myself out of complaining. I'm talking myself out of saying I, I could have had it better, but I could have had it a whole lot worse. This is what the Bible tells us to do when we look at Jesus. Consider Him, lest we be weary and faint in our minds. When I'm tempted to give up, consider Jesus. When I'm tempted to give up, consider Abraham. Praise the Lord. I'm thinking about Ruth. I'm thinking about Deborah. I'm looking at David, who was rejected by the one who should have looked after him, his very king. And then when he was able to reign, he wasn't able to reign over all of the children of Israel, but for seven years, only in Judah. And then God blessed him. And all the difficulties that he went through, it could have been me. 
It could have been worse off in my situation. I thank God for everything that I have. What is trauma? Having to go to work every day to make a living. It's not suffering. There's a lot of people that wish they could. I was reading Country Driving by journalist Peter Hessler who lived about 22 years in China. And you should read it. It's fascinating. He took illegal road trips throughout China. And it, it was when he took the trips, it was only about 20 years ago, so in the modern era. And, of course, uh, the foreigners, journalists, diplomats, not allowed to leave the big cities except for the permit. He did it anyway, and he drove all over China to see it. He found a region that was so poor that the government was paying them to work for the government with freeze-dried noodles. Do you know what getting paid food for working is called? It's called slavery. He found instances of slavery in modern-day China. So me going to work every day for a living, thank God. Because you know what they pay me at the bus barn? Twice a month they pay me money for driving the bus. They don't pay me ramen noodles. Thank God. You see the difference between suffering, real suffering, and my situation. Being forced to work without pay and being owned by another person. That's trauma. Suffering makes you choose, uh, can make us choose to focus our lives and our mind and our mental energy on the wrong things. This, the era, one of the eras that we're in is where people believe that words are traumatic. I believe, I understand that there is such a thing as emotional abuse. I'm not denying that. It's absolutely true. Um, but it is also true uh, that sticks and stones may break my bones, but words may never hurt me. You know who said that? Someone of character on the playground that was ignoring the difficulties. Our society tells us that we're supposed to bend and break anybody says something to us that we don't like. But a person that is of strong Christian character takes it to Jesus and says, Lord Jesus, you hear those words. Keep your hand and bless that person. The Bible tells us to bless the ones that curse us. The teaching of modern trauma does not teach us that. The teaching of modern trauma says, everybody needs to know what this person said to me. Everybody needs to know how I've been treated. And it needs to end up in a court of law. And we need to pass a law to make sure this person can't say that anymore. At some point, you can't pass any more laws. This is, this is the, te this, the teaching that there is such a thing as violent words, which is impossible because the word violent literally means using physical force and didn't intend to hurt, damage, or kill someone or something. So there's no such thing as violent words. There are violent actions. So you can't be physically hurt by someone's words. Get that thinking out of your mind because if you don't, you're going to be offended at everything. But the Bible says, great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. The Bible tells us that the truth about trauma is found in the peace of Jesus Christ. I'm not saying that I've never had my feelings hurt, but I'm going to tell you something right now. I've been corrected by the Lord more than one time when I was all in the mully grub because something somebody said to me, and the Lord let me know the power there is just words. Somebody was talking to me recently about something somebody said, and I prayed, Lord, I don't know how to respond to this person. He's just whining. And I was not going to tell him, you're just whining. <laughs> Probably not the wisest thing to say. So the Holy Ghost said, tell him it's just words. Words. Those words are spoken. And they have power over you if you choose to allow them to have power over you. Right. And I want to do a little spiritual thing right now. Close your eyes. I'm praying in the Spirit, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke every lie that's ever been spoken over every person here. I bind that lie and I send it back where it came from, from the depths of hell. And I pray healing over the effects that that lie had on that person that's here into the sound of my voice, even someone that might be watching this video. I lose healing over them, Lord, from those words. And I lose the book, the, the word of revelation over their, their minds that they would understand that words do not have to have power over them in the name of Jesus. Now let's praise the Lord for victory. I'm a victor in the name of Jesus. I'm victorious in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus.
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. So we understand that the era that we're in, of course, is calling good evil and evil good. So we need to go back to the definitions carved from the immovable rock of common sense. Things that our grandparents knew were true and were false as they labored every day just to survive and feed themselves. They had character born out of survival. We can find sanity in our day if we get the definitions right. We are called to come out of this world and, quote, save ourselves from this untoward generation, which is a word that means perverse. The perverseness includes the victim culture. And you know what the victim culture is? It's me worshiping myself. I worship myself. There are people around me. If I'm filled with the Holy Ghost and baptized in Jesus' name, I'm supposed to be victorious. And Brother James, there's people around me that need help. But all I can think about is me, 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 me. Help me, Jesus. I've got to help people. And guess what? You've got to help people too. The Lord has put people in your pathway to love them and to reach for them and to pick them up on the road to Samaria and to put salve in their wounds and pour wine and oil and pay the innkeeper enough to get them and take care of until you come back. That's the good Samaritan. That's the message of that parable of Jesus. The other two, the priest and the Levite, were only thinking about me, 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 me. But my, my, help us, Lord Jesus. Help us, Lord. There's no room in biblical doctrine for self-pity. Self-pity is another term for self Centered, self pity is another term for self centered, and we've all been there. At, at I am not trying to say I have not been there myself. I definitely have. But the best way to deal with self, which is the whole problem of of the worship of victimhood, is by self examination. Here in another uh, couple of weeks, we're going to be having communion, and this is what the Bible tells us: "But let a man examine himself." There's something powerful that happens in the communion service because everybody is examining himself or herself and looking inward. And there's power there. It, is, it isn't just that, of course. It's the focusing on the, on the blood and body of Jesus Christ. But we're examining ourselves, and it's happening at the same time. And there's so much power there. Self-examination is taught in the Scripture. It happens when we repent. For the first time in our lives, when we repent, we are finding, even if we're just a young, I was seven years old, but I was examining myself. I felt conviction because I was a sinner. I was equal at the foot of the cross with anybody. You could put me up against Pol Pot, Joseph Stalin, or Adolf Hitler. I was just as much a sinner, even though I hadn't done any of the things they had done, because sin is sin. <laughs> And without Jesus, I was going to go to hell. But the power of the Holy Ghost came down through the preaching of my pastor, Cecil Bennett. And he began to preach. And I got convicted of sin. I went down to that altar on a Sunday morning night in Corinth, Mississippi. And I, I prayed and I cried. I examined myself as much as a seven-year-old can. And the Lord came down and gave me grace and mercy and forgave me of my sins. And I confessed Him. And by going forward in front of people, I also confessed him before man. I examined myself, but the Bible tells us that every time we pray, we're supposed to self-examination, do a self-examination and look into our hearts. My Lord, give us this day our daily bread. Forgive, bread. give, for whatever it says, I cannot say it. <laughs> Somebody by the name of Brett. <laughs> I don't know what I'm saying. And forgive us our debts. As we forgive our debtors. Lord, forgive me of my debts. Show me my debts, Lord Jesus, in self-examination. I'm looking into my heart, Lord. Some, uh, Let's see, look at 2 Corinthians 13 and 5. I'm closing with this. 2 Corinthians 13 and 5. Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Wow. <clears throat> know you not your own selves? How that Jesus Christ is in you, or except you be reprobates? Paul is challenging the Corinthian church, saying, don't you know yourself? This is a powerful thing. This scripture is a powerful scripture. In it, we are challenged to examine ourselves in times other than 
initial repentance, daily prayer, or communion with the church, but that we ought to examine ourselves at all times and look inwardly and say, Lord Jesus, is, are you in me? Isn't that awesome? Amen. Don't you know? Alan Hush, is Jesus Christ in you? Unless you're a reprobate, then he's working in your life. Am I that? Lord, help me, Jesus. Not to get a heart like a stone, but have a tender heart towards you, Lord Jesus. Help me not to trust in myself. Help me not to believe that my sufferings, whether they be real or manufactured trauma or victimhood, doesn't matter if they happened in the past, if they were my fault or they were somebody else's fault. Doesn't matter if they're happening right now. And it doesn't matter if I'm afraid that they were yet to come. And I want to feel sorry for myself because of what is yet to come. Doesn't matter. If Jesus Christ is in me, I can be a victor. Amen. If I know that he's in me. But if I'm focusing on myself, I'm going to be worried. Oh, Lord, if you come right now, I don't know if I'm going to make it. Because I've done things because I felt sorry for myself. Self-pity drives us into eventually backsliding. But it drives us into secret sins and all sorts of other things. So we become self-centered. But when we examine ourselves, asking the question, am I in the faith? Proving myself. The Bible says, let us consider one another to provoke one another to love and to good works. It's part of the beauty of being in the church and coming to the house of God is that we are provoking one another to love and good works. I'm not the only one that's going to get some good things said tonight. Mm -hmm. You're going to talk to each other. You talk to each other before church, and you're going to talk to each other after church. You're going to encourage each other. And as you fellowship also outside of the church service, you're provoking one another to love and to good works, and you're helping each other examine each other. This is why we fellowship. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. That I can be a victor Hallelujah. instead of a victim. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I love you, Lord. I glorify your name. Hallelujah. I want to know the truth, O oh Lord, and I want it to make me free, Jesus. Hallelujah. hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Blessed is your holy name. You are so worthy to be praised, dear Lord. I'm stirred up in my spirit to be like Jesus and to look to you when I'm tempted to focus on the things of this world. Thank you, Lord, for all that you've done. Oh, Lord, I consider Hallelujah. my life and how blessed I am. Are you here tonight? And now you begin to remember how blessed you are. You're so blessed. Amen. You're so blessed. And when you know how blessed you are, you desire to not be the center of attention. Jesus becomes the center of attention. Amen. Everybody look at Jesus. <laughs> Everybody look at Jesus. Praise the Lord. He's the one that deserves the glory. He's the one that doesn't get enough attention in this world. If this world gave Jesus the attention he deserves, everybody of every race would get along and love each other. There would be no more wars if Jesus praised the Lord. Amen. The scripture says that they're going to study war no more. Thank you, Lord. They will learn war no more. Praise God. When Jesus is the center of attention, there will be peace on the earth. Amen. There's going to come a day when Jesus is going to be enthroned and people from every nation will come and worship him. Praise the Lord. Their plowshares will be uh, made out of swords. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. It's going to be reversed. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Won't need those weapons anymore. The Bible says they're going to burn outside of Jerusalem for seven years. Won't need those weapons of war anymore. Hallelujah. There's peace. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In our hearts. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. The answer to trauma is peace. Yes. Hallelujah. And peace comes through the Prince of Peace. Jesus is peace. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Amen.